Tyler Stone. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. This is fun. Thank you. Thanks for coming on board. I am super excited to chat with you today. Um, and I, I want to, I'd love for you to, uh, give us, give us a little intro about, um, who you are and, and where you, where you're in San Francisco now. You're based there. No, I'm, I'm actually oh. in Portland, Oregon. So, okay. but, but you know, San Francisco is home. Like if there's mm. one place I've lived in many cities throughout my life, but if there's one place it's home, it's San Francisco for sure. Okay. So. And, 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 and where were you born? New Brunswick, Canada. Okay. A little, a little town of, of 1,400 people called St. Andrews by the Sea. Most beautiful, per- picture perfect place you could ever imagine. It sounds amazing. <laughs> it's probably, it, that probably explains all my optimism in life, right? I, I mean, I started my life in like the most picture perfect setting. So I figured the whole world was like this and I was going to go out and just share it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you've had you've had quite an interesting um, uh, music history, in t- especially with dance music and dance music culture. I, I, I'd love to learn more about that and, and how where this started. Like, because you've been very much in the sort of house music community, working with some amazing people over the years. Tell me where, Thank you. where, and how did that happen? Well, I mean, the bug for dance music started in my youth, in my childhood, with you know the sounds of disco and, and just, I, I couldn't get enough of that. And I was just a kid and I, I didn't really know what it was or how it all worked. I just knew it, I liked it and it resonated with me. But when you talk about like, where did it all begin for me? Truly, it was in San Francisco. So again, that's why San Francisco is so much a part of my home. It's so much a part of who I am. It's where I spent really, it's really where I grew up, you know, like I, I just became who I am today. Um, so, yeah, so that was um, just being there at the time that I was there. I moved there like almost like 91, 92, somewhere in there. And I got to just immerse myself in what was really just a, almost a, like a cultural revolution of sorts. I mean, this is how we felt as we were going through it, me and my friends. Um, and it was a magical time, you know, and, and I got to immerse myself in this music that I loved and it was music that made people dance. And it was, it was about, you know, feeling good and coming together. And I mean, just by the name of the clubs alone, unity and, um, I mean, come unity and, um, oh, I can't even think of them all now, but they were all about, in, you know, being together and, and, and just celebrating life together. So it was magical. Mm. And, and, and your production, your production journey started back then, and then there's there was there was a, a gap, and I, um, because you were pursuing other other uh, aspirations, but but music's been there all along, and um, and so tell me, well, what, there wasn't you, a gap, you, you, there you, wasn't a gap in my production. Oh. It was just a gap in doing house and dance music, and it was still electronic focused, right. but. You know, like I went Mm. from really being heavily focused on house and deep house to I I got the two-step bug and I went down that road for a minute and I love, I still love two-step. I mean, MJ Cole, hello, one of my absolute favorite producers, right? (laughs) Um, So I still love that. And then I, um, then I really got into down tempo and my husband and I started this down tempo night. We started DJing. And then from there, we created a band and then it, we got into this whole live electronic thing, right? When like the whole, like, I can't even remember what they used to call it, like live PA, right? Or something like this. And, oh, it's, it's electronic, but it's live, you know? So it was like this whole new thing that, and so we were doing that. And, um, and it, what was fun about that for me was I finally got to kind of exercise my vocal chops again, because that was my major. I majored in voice in jazz and I went back to songwriting and singing, which is kind of where like early, early on in my youth where I started was singer, singer, songwriter, but I wanted to do dance music. So, you know, but then when I really got into house music, I mean, I'm hearing Martha Wash and I'm hearing, you know, Jocelyn Enriquez and I'm hearing all these singers. I'm like, oh, I don't sing like that. That is, oh, I'm, I'm not even gonna try to compete with that. So I just kind of shut up. <laughs> 
<laughs> and let the girls have their space and and uh got into the production side of it so <laughs> And, and you've, you've worked with some like legendary labels, um, Strictly Rhythm, 8-Ball, Henry Street, all, all these, these labels uh, are um, part of, you know, the fabric of, of uh, dance music today and they've la laid down a lot of foundations. That, what, what, what kind of things were you doing for these labels? Um, mostly remixes, actually. So um, probably the biggest record I've done to date is I remixed Armand Van Helden's Funk Phenomena. And I originally didn't even do it for the label. I did it for this, um, this record pool. I think it was a record pool service. It was this thing called Hot Tracks. They're not around anymore, but um, they used to bring me in to do remixes for their releases. But in order, before they could release it, they'd have, it was all like on the up and up through the label. So the label would deliver the files and, then they would have to deliver it back to the label to um, get their approval before they could put it out. So often what that would result in was me, the label, wanting to just put my remix out on the actual label as well. So that's how the Armand Van Helden one came about. Um, and it's so funny to talk about, but it's like we didn't have Internet back then. So I had <laughs> no idea how big this record was. I mean, it was a hit club hit, you know, it, I knew that when you went mm -hmm. to the club, if you didn't hear that track, you know, it wasn't a, wasn't a real night. So, um, so I knew it was a big record, but I had no idea until Discogs came along, like how much my remix had been licensed all over the world. Like I, I just was clueless to the impact that that record had. So, um, I, I often wonder, you know, if I'd known then what I know now, like what, how could I have leveraged that? I don't know. So, but mm -hmm. it was, it was interesting, interesting time. But yeah, so, and then 8Ball was, 8Ball kind of came around the same way, actually. It was a local label that hired me to do a remix of a local band. Um, and they put it out. Oh, I can't think of the name of the label. Daisy. Crap. My my girlfriend Charlotte the Baroness, who's still to this day an amazing DJ, um, brought me on for the project. And it was a project of all the same all these different San Francisco house music producers remixing the labels um artists. And this one particular remix that I did got licensed by Eight Ball. So that's how it ended up on Eight Ball. So um mm. Just all, all kinds of things. Like a lot of my, I have all these weird, like weaving stories like that about how things ended up places. I've, although my favorite remix story is when I, I did Judy Cheeks. I don't know if you know who she is. I remember she was, yeah. do you remember Judy Cheeks? I love her so much. The, was she she the, did, one the real doing, deal the hip, was her. The hip hop, the hip hop compilations that the j jazz meets hip hop. Is that her? Mm. No, I don't no? think so. She no? she was okay. on she was on Positiva, and she I, the right, real okay. deal was her hit that I remember. This is the real deal. But um, okay, so I could be mixing she up. She had a else. record. Mm. She had a record with I think it was Popular Records, and I knew the A and R guy there, and I basically begged him for the remix. <laughs> I mean, I whined. Mm -hmm. I I was like, I want to do Judy Cheeks. So he sent me the, um, and, and he, they hadn't planned on doing it. They'd already, oh, we already have, I'm like, no, 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 no. I want to do this one. I said, so he was like, okay, well, I'll send you the, the vocals. So he sent me the vocals and I knocked out really this killer mix and, um, sent it back and, and they loved it and they picked it up. So a lot of the stuff I did, it was just like me kind of force feeding myself down <laughs> <laughs> and just being like, I want to do that. Let me do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I wonder if, like, because at this, um, you know, obviously you, you, you were in these circles and these communities of people that you were able to, to have those dialogues and these conversations. It was that difficult for you, like, um, back then, like, to be able to at least present. These, no, these ideas I had, or, I had two hmm. things, two things going for me. One, I was associated with third floor productions 
And DJ EFX right. and Digit were kind of, you know, the DJs du jour in San Francisco. They had the remix show. They were pulling in a lot of um, work at that time. Um, the second thing was going to conventions, um, Billboard Music Summit that Larry Flick had put on and Winter Music Conference when it was still Winter Music Conference. And I would go and probably, you know, so that combination of being associated with third floor productions, I met everybody. So I was mm. down there meeting people. Mm. And so for me, going to these conferences were all about showing up, meeting people and coming back with work. And that's kind of still how I look at conferences to this day. I stopped going to winter music conference because I was like, oh, this is too much of a party. I'm not here to party. I'm here to get work. <laughs> this isn't serving me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I can see all these DJs in San Francisco. I don't need to fly across the country for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's certainly interesting because that that like uh, especially back then, I think maybe because you mentioned before about leverage of um, trying to sort of understand the um, now that you've you, years have passed, you've been able to kind of like understand the the business more and 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 how things. And I think, I think as far as dance music is concerned as well, like it was a um, in these last 20, 30 years, say nineties and the thousands, and now, like that that the electronic music industry is that's when it it was it took its own life, and we've been able to kind of look, it's DIY. We've been learning along the way, and now that that we're kind of seeing how um, people like yourself and others be, like at the same time would. We're doing things now. There is a bit of a blueprint on on how to do stuff, right? Um, and 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 that, like you also mentioned, you know, the conversations. Um, because back then, having these conversations with people like that was was un almost untouchable, you know. Whereas now, you can drop DMs in social media. No, people, no, almost, no, you know? no. It wasn't untouchable at all because you'd go to these conferences and there just were not that many people there. So you, you, so you, you know, know you, you had to the proximity. You had to go to those places, but now, like, I guess it's it, that's what I meant. You know, it's a, it, you had. Oh to, yeah, well, but, now but can, I find yeah. that much easier, quite honestly, because like if I'm like looking into your eyes and I'm talking to you and we have a connection and we're having a drink together and we're dancing, and we're going, oh my god, this Todd Terry track yeah. is so good. I mean, now we have a connection, right? And now mm -hmm. when I say, I want to do the Judy Chinks, you, uh, you know who I am. You know, I'm not just this <laughs> crazy girl showing up on your DM begging you to do the Judy Chinks, right? So, yeah, I yeah, think, yeah, yeah. you know, you developed the relationship first before you, anything else happened. It was all like you were just all there under the same roof, have, you know, exploring music together, talking about whatever panel you were just at and you know, and, and, you know, dishing dirt or whatever, and, and just having a good time together. And so for me, that was a much easier way to connect with people than having to do it through an email or a DM where you're not yeah. seeing my facial expression. You're not hearing my voice. You're not like you're, I'm, <laughs> I always joke around. That, I mean, I hate writing so much. I hate the written word. I hate emails. I hate texts. I hate social. I hate all of it. I don't, I just don't want to communicate that way. That's not, I like to talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so much so more fun. I, uh, yeah, absolutely. I agree. And I think what you, what you're describing is that um, it's almost like, let's just stick to the basics, you know, and let's like have those, those communications like face to face and, and try to connect with people to create collaborative uh, opportunities or, or, or um, you know, working on projects. Let's let's just keep it back to the way it used to be. <laughs> well, I mean, um, it's a, it, makes it's a, a lot different of sense. kind. It's a different kind of communication too. And if you think about it, like when you're in a band and you're, you know, like I'm the singer, which usually that's my role in the band. Um, you know, you got the drummer, the bass player, the guitar, the keyboards, and you're all playing, but you're 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 seeing each other. So, like, if I look over. They know, oh, we're going to bring it down or we're going to bring it up or we're going to bust it. Like there's, we're looking at each other for that communication, sure. right? We're feeling it. Yeah. We're in the same room together. We can tell, mm. or you're, or you're even communicating with the audience. You can, there's like, 
excitement. You feel the audience get excited. And so you start amping it up too. I mean, even during a DJ set, you know, you're reading the room, you're feeling the interaction with people. You're not, it's not stagnant. You're not just hitting play. I know this is my, I mean, maybe some people do, but I don't like, you know, like you're feeling the, the, the energy of the people in the room. And I, I don't, I just don't think there's a replacement for that when you're talking about Mm. online. So. Yeah. 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 I mean, look, look, we've, we've definitely seen, um, in these last couple of years, uh, obviously, uh, um, a, 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 a huge rise of, of digital streaming and all these sort of things that are happening. And there, there've been obviously a lot of people benefiting from that. But I, and I always, you know, I see that, that there is, I think there's pros and cons for both, you know, like, um, with with uh, commu- with with the, with technology and 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 without you know um, and the, the benefits that can be um, available to us because of that as well. Um, yeah, I mean we're now, benefiting from it right now. I didn't have to fly yeah, to exactly. Disney for this yeah. interview. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Not that I wouldn't um, have. I would have loved to have flown to Sydney, but. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, it does. It definitely makes the the um, these kind of projects and these kind of things, um, you know, uh, able to exist. Um, yeah. The um, yeah. Tell me how how did how did the the um, the meet like you you connect with um, Third Floor and, and th- those guys? Oh wow, that's um, so. That was my first job out of college, which I love to refer to as my master's degree after receiving a bachelor's in jazz at Cornish College of the Arts in Seattle. I, I, this was kind of another one of those, I want this job or like, I won't accept anything else, pounding my fist kind of thing. Um, I had to go get that interview and I, I worked for a label called Nasty Mix Records and it was kind of the only game in town at the time in Seattle. I went, my, I went to college in Seattle. And um, so I worked my way into the A&R artist relations position. And we signed this group called Four Way. And the main producer was DJ EFX. So he and I, because we were on the phone every day, developed a friendship. And I think that was right around that time that I went to my very first winter music conference and like got hit over the head with house music and went, Whoa, this is it. And so he's like, I, I love telling, telling the story. I'll, I'll never forget. He would say, he's like, baby, you just don't know. You got to come down to San Francisco. You just don't know. You can't be in Seattle. You've got to come down here where the clubs are, the scene is, you've got to, you've got to feel the music. You've got to be in the club. And I was <laughs> like, okay, okay, I believe you. So I did. I just, took off and I went to San Francisco and the rest is history. And so then, you know, they already had this whole third floor thing going on and I just kind of plopped myself right into it. And, you know, thanks to EFX, like he just set me like, I mean, there was a computer in every room and a mixing board in every room. And he was like, here, just, you know, sit down. And we were using performer, not digital performer. And he's like, Teach me how to do MIDI. He's like, all right, you hit this, you do. It was so simple back then too. It's like, you know, a two minute lesson. And he's like, I'll be in the other room if you need. This is, you know, here's how the mixing board works and go. So, but, you know, and then they were bringing all these projects in. And so as I got better and better, they'd throw projects at me. And, and um, it just, I, I mean, I loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. So. What, a, what, an, what an amazing time and place to have been, like, especially in those early days of San Francisco as well, because I, I remember, um, you know, I was, I, like, back then myself, I, I was so um, in love with what was coming out on the East Coast. And, and then when I came across San Francisco, I was like, wow, this is really funky and this is amazing. So, I'm, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm an Australian kid, like, lo- learning from, what was happening in the US. And in fact, in the early 2000s, my, um, I, I, I was able to produce an event um, with Corey Black. Um, oh, yeah. From, yeah, from, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. know Corey. Yeah, and, awesome. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I, I had, in 2001, that was my, one of my first sort of events 
that I that there was a sort of like an actually what I'd probably say was my first international booking um, was Corey <laughs> Black, you know, in two thousand and one. Awesome. <laughs> and so, I mean, I was in love with the, the, the San Francisco sound by this stage and, um, you know, Dub Tribe, that whole movement, those guys that were doing, um, they, they uh, were making a lot of noise in Australia at the time with their sound, you know, it was super exciting. Um, you know, Frank Mark Farina, he was, yep. he was um, a regular in Australia at the time as well. Yeah. So your your Chris Lum your, did, Chris, did did you hang did you get Chris Lum was coming I, down there a lot too I think yeah 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 absolutely um, yeah and you worked with Chris Lum yes uh huh yeah yeah Chris was amazing Chris, so Chris is you know he was at BPM so third floor was on the third floor of the building and BPM Records was the the DJ record store on the main on the first floor and. So Chris Lum worked at BPM, and that's how I met him, at, like when he was how? just just a wee baby. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Well, so you're, you've you've come back, say, like full circle back into house music. When did that happen? Like, like so you were saying that you were you were um, exploring, and you were down the the, the down tempo. Um, route and then when did say the 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 when did the the, the light bulb the switch bug. for you again to say yes the bug where did it come back again you know? <laughs> um <laughs> well you know it was actually it was just before the pandemic and i was re i had reset up my studio i had gotten rid of all my outboard gear i had gone fully in the box which I still am and I'm loving, except I'd love to have a giant mixing board. That's the only thing I mix, miss. But I, so it was like 20, I'm going to say it was tw like 28, like fall of 2018, somewhere in there. Um, I just, I was, I don't know. I just was like, I want to do this again. And I said, I got to go to Winter Music Conference. So, cause that's, you know, where it all started for me. Right. And, oh, I know. Cause Winter Music Conference had just brought back the conference portion of the conference so you know uh <laughs> which is your jam uh, that's what you want to go the, there yeah for. <laughs> that's where i started right so i was like oh good so so you know everything had turned into ultra festival which is great if you're going to go party but yeah so I, and i thought oh this is going to be great because it's going to be small again right and small is good because that's when you rub elbows with everybody who's there. And the, and I knew that the people that would be there would be like a lot of the creme de la creme that knew from back in the day. So I was like, oh, I have chance of me running into some people I know are pretty damn good. So mm. I had it on my agenda to do and I put it off and I put it off and I put it off. And I think it was maybe two weeks, three, maybe three weeks before I went, oh, shit, am I going to do this? And I went online to see if I could book my ticket with Miles and somehow through the grace of God, there was a flight available through Alaska Airlines to Miami <laughs> from Portland. I mean, it's just like, so I don't even think it exists anymore. Um, and I was like, I'm doing this. And I just, you know, got on a plane and I went to the conference and sure enough, ran into all, I mean, there were a few people I touched base that I knew were living there and I knew I'd see them anyway. But then there were all these other people. I just, it was just like magic overnight. And I came back and I just started working with this one label in particular, Aventura, who's, who Pierre Zonzon, I met at my very first winter music conference ever. So that's how long I've known him. And we hadn't seen each other probably almost as long, you know, since the last time I'd been to Miami, early 2000s or something. So we, so the way we reconnected was I, we even reconnected through another friend and my, fr the friend said, oh, she's in town. Oh, I want to see you, Tyler. So he texts me and I'm, and we're trying to figure it out and we couldn't get a schedule. And he's like, well, let me pick you up and take you to the airport. So literally that was when we saw each other and he starts playing me all the stuff he's working with on. He's like, you should do some remixes. And I'm like, I'm in. So, um, it, so that. Start, he just started throwing me a bunch of remixes and it was just such a great kind of like, boom, I'm back, kickstart. And, you know, some of the projects, this one project that he was giving me, 
this guy. Oh, I I'm so bad with names. Anyway, he just started throwing me a bunch of remixes and it was beautiful and it just really kickstarted me back into it. Okay, so now enter the pandemic happens. And I am like, I'm thinking I'm going back to a music conference this year. I'm going to keep this party going and mm. everything shuts down, right? Well, Pierre just kept sending me stuff and I just was like, I just kept going. And then that's when I kind of came back to this whole disco thing. And I started really feeling like this is the music I want to make because everything just seemed so oppressive with the pandemic and just with, you know, just all the everything, civil unrest and everything that was going on. And mm. I wanted to make music that made people feel good, that made me feel good. Right. So that's where I really kind of went from, I want to get back into house music to this is the kind of house music I want to do. So. Yeah. Po positive, positive vibes, right? Like you want to, that, yeah. that, and it makes a lot of sense why it seems, it, it, it also, it seems that, um, you know, the sort of soulful sounds and, and, um, is so, is so important right now. Like even yeah. now, like at this point, like, and it just seems, yep. Um, like what people just really want to hear, you know, just like it's almost like the the music, um, almost like a a dance music revolution again, you know. Yeah, um, it is. It, it's I, soothing, I, you know. Mm, it's uplifting, mm, but it's also soothing at the same time. Mm, mm. And and I think for you too, it sounds like it was a good timing um, to during the pandemic to be getting some work as well, like. While like being able to work on projects during that period um, must have been um, a relief for you as, as well. You know, like you sort of came in at the right time almost. It was a relief and it was also a, a place to focus my energy because also <laughs> kind of compounding the whole thing, like literally right when lock, like right when they said, oh, we have a pandemic, I had just gone up to Canada to stay with my mother who been hospitalized and she ended up passing and this is just as everything's starting so i had kind of like i was coming off of that whole thing and then then i came out of that dealing with this pandemic and just kind of freaked out about the whole thing and not really sure mm. so it was really a wonderful way to just kind of pull all my energy and and focus on something really positive and uplifting and make me feel positive you know and just make me feel like there was something good and hopeful, you know, that I was working yeah. with. So yeah, amazing. Well, the, it, it, and during during especially in 2020, there seemed to be a spike in sales for for, for um, uh, record labels and independent dance music labels. There was, you know, the the spike in um, vinyl pressing, and um, it, it, it and you kind of it almost sounds counterintuitive because like there was like where people, and it makes sense though, right? When you think about it, people are at home, they want to um, buy tunes, they want to, you know, and-, and They have more time now it, to, to actually listen yeah, to music, yeah, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, seems, it seems like that's what's happened too. This is like appreciation of, of listening to records again, like, because we've been so bombarded with so many options. Um, it, it's almost like, you know, um, Spotify and that while they're great platforms to, to access tunes, it also creates this sort of ADHD in, you know, uh, <laughs> listening to, to music. And now we're, we're right. like, and I, I feel like we, the, the listening experience has kind of almost gone back to, um, listening to albums in full and, you know, rather than just sit, sitting there skipping through tracks and, yeah, yeah, and I don't know if that's um, our generation or if it's if that's carrying through to the to the youth. Um, you know, I do think that youth listens to music very differently. Um, they because that's how they were brought up to listen to it. You know, I think you know clearly there's some youth that is helping to drive the whole vinyl explosion, but a lot of times, like the first, <laughs> I'll never forget talking to this 20 something and he's like 
oh, you do dance music? Oh, I've got this song you've got to hear. Oh, well, who is it? Oh, I don't know who the artist is. I'm like, well, do they have anything else? Oh, I don't know. I just like this one song. Well, what's it called? I'm not sure, but I think I have it on my plate. I, he didn't know the name of the artist, the name of the song. He didn't know anything about it, mm. just that he liked mm. it. And then next week it would be another one. And that was just, that one was going to be lost forever. Like he wouldn't even remember probably the next two months, which that, mm. that was his favorite song. And I thought, oh, wow, what a horrible way to experience music where you just like, I mean, we did it too to a point, but we had, we had so much more to hang on to with it. Like we, we could reference it, you know, in so many more mm. ways than, than to have mm. it just like, like fly by like that. So, so I, I mean, it's hard to know. I mean, I hope the youth is, is taking more notice on the music but what i do enjoy is seeing people you know who who maybe had not had stopped listening to music because life got busy and got caught up on them and you know mm. maybe they got into their job or they had kids or got married or whatever and you know life was happening they were adulting and, and then i feel like now all of a sudden those people are coming back to music and having a whole new appreciation for it in ways that maybe they, they wouldn't have otherwise because they had all this time on their hands. So, mm, mm. Well, it, it certainly seems like there's a um, hunger for narratives now. Like people want to be, like people wanting connection and storytelling with music. And, yeah. And um, – they want to connect the dots. They want to learn about it because of the influx of this, what, what we're describing, you know, like I feel like now that there's, and, and, not, and I know it's a whole other conversation, the whole NFT world. Um, it right. seems that, that that's what the NFT culture is bringing back because it, it's almost like having something tangible to to, right. to to experience to and hold it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. and that that's what I find is is why there's this boom happening with NFTs. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's something that you're looking into doing yourself. But, I have I have uh, been. Yeah. I've been really curious about it. I think, you know, in, in some ways it feels like, oh God, one more thing on my plate. But I feel like <laughs> <laughs> but I do feel like, you know, the whole NFT experience, it, I feel like it's a very visual experience. And I feel like as a musician and a music producer, it's about attaching yourself to somebody who might be the visual version of your music, right? So that's, that's kind of hard to find. Um, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of people out there experimenting around with it and, and some are doing it very well and others are just kind of, you know, doing what they can. But I, I do think it's kind of hard to find that visual match because it's kind of like taking the, the, the video, the MTV video up a notch, right? And making mm. it be a full experience now that you've attached your music to. And then now you can mint it and blah, blah, blah. But um, I, I think some people are doing it in really interesting ways. And I, I just applaud them. I think it's fun. Like I was just watching the artist Dot, um, who had decided to do her track on the fly in front of her, maybe her Instagram audience or something like this, maybe on Reels. I'm not quite sure. So she did the track on the fly, finished the track in the thing, and then minted it and sent it out as an FT. F, uh, uh, thank you. A, um, I can't be funny to say PDF. <laughs> 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 anyway, and it, said, it minted it, and, and here it is for the world. And I just think that's so cool because I'm, I, but like, I, I just wouldn't even think. To do that, I'd kind of be like, does, that, does somebody actually want that? But when I watched her do it, I thought, oh, that's really cool. So mm. I think it's just, you know, it's about being creative and coming up with interesting ways to, you know, present something unique enough yeah. to mint. So, 
Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it is, it's certainly a new world for that. And, and I, um, and you're right. There are, um, people experimenting at this stage and, and, but you, and, and there are, um, I've seen really impressive, um, models and ecosystems that, uh, people are uh, creating amazing communities and projects and, and doing rather well. Yes. Um, with, with, and, um, and it, D- redefining the, the 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 old school um mu- business music business model you know and, right um yeah I, I think it's exciting times i think that it's going to be super interesting what's going to um what we're going to see over the next couple of years um yeah and i'm, I'm now, really hopeful for mm, it too because there's mm, a lot of like anything new there's a lot of flack and pushback and and talk about oh this is nothing and this is this is going to just go away. It's just another fad. And I, I don't think it is. I think there's something here. And, no. and the, the end result may not be what everybody thinks it is, but it'll be really fascinating to see where it takes us, you know? So, mm, mm. yeah, for sure. For sure. Now, but you, you have, have you been able to, um, now that things are uh, opening up and uh, the, in terms of DJing again, because I know you want to get back out there and play. And are you um, finding that, um, that, that is that moving in the right direction for you? Uh, well, what I decided to do in the interim here is create, you know, everybody was doing Twitch and I'm not a Twitch fan. I just, it's not, it's not my platform. It's not right for me. So I thought, okay, well, what can I do? Because I wanted to just do something consistently. Um, and so I decided to, cre- I created this um, just kind of DJ mix on Mixcloud called All That Glitters. And what I'm trying to do is with each release that I have, I always end up doing a DJ chart. And so then I pull from that DJ chart and I create a whole mix from that. So that keeps it consistent and keeps it out there and keeps my chops going. And, um, and so what I'm hoping to do is, you know, as, you know, as I get into this and and really start to develop a brand around it, then be able to take that to a live scenario. But I haven't figured out what that, that is yet. It's kind of like, where is that? You know, do I, you know, I've, batted around the idea of just going back down to San Francisco and just doing a monthly in San Francisco because that just feels good. You know, it's just, it's home. Right. So, um, but I'm, I don't know. There's, I'm just batting all kinds of ideas around right now. So we'll see. That's where great. <laughs> That's great. It's great. Now I, 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 um, what I find, what I'd like to discuss with you now is, is the new single and that, that, um, and I find it mind blowing that, um, that that you're the first female on large, which is a late that I just find that just after because a label for thirty years, it's I been know. such a prom, prominent dance music label, house music label, and you're the first first female like to be uh, yeah. Tell me, I, I tell should me have a bit been on that. it. I should have been on it thirty years ago, but yeah, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I'm sure it's not intentional, and I think I, you know, I have to give mad props to Large for. Um, like really embracing that and celebrating it as kind of a, a tipping point for them too. So, um, but yeah, it's kind of crazy to think that in 30 years. And I mean, I can tell you most certainly that they are not the only label that's been around that long mm. that has never had a female on them. Um, <laughs> wow. So, so it's, it, I don't even know what to say about it anymore. Quite honestly, it's, I, I think all, all I have to say is I think that the conversation that's happening now compared to the conversations that were happening 10, 20 years ago, I think they're much more positive conversations and they're headed in a much better direction. I think 20 years ago, it was a real us and them conversation. And now it's an us conversation, all of us. So together. Mm. And I think that's a much healthier way to look at it that mm. we're all in this together and we can all solve this problem together it's not you know it's it's not this this you're not giving us anything you know 
I think I think it's it's just it it's a lot of it is just societal bias and I yeah. will tell you that I myself as a woman have been victim of it on both the receiving and the giving end. I mean, I've looked at mm. women and going, you don't know how to do that. I mean, I've done this. So mm. I know mm. how easy it is to n- not, we're just not, like when you're just not used to seeing uh, certain kinds of people in certain roles, your mind, yes. you have to adjust your mind to it. I mean, my people yes. used to tell me all the time, you don't look like a producer. And I'm like, well, what do I look like? Well, I don't know, like a manager or something, you know? So, <laughs> and, and then I remember reading this article about how at a certain point, if you remember back maybe in the 70s, even maybe in the 80s, but early 80s, but there were no women uh, anchors on the news. And the idea was that they, people would not take the news seriously from a woman. And even Mm. when they did start bringing female anchors on, they had women with lower voices. And because they were taken more seriously, they're more authoritarian. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I, I, I remember reading this article and thinking, wow, that is so fascinating. But yes, and, and now, like, we don't think twice. Of course, there's, a, you know, women, men, whatever. We don't think twice about it. But um, I mm. think, you know, the same transition just had to happen naturally with, with dance music and DJs. And I feel like when I first got into it, there were no no uh borders or boundaries and i was kind of one of the few women but at the, at a certain point it got really duty it got it just got really su- it just became such a dude scene and it, yeah. it wasn't like that when i first got in and it just like it just became that way and i don't i don't know why it did it just did and so you it was just a matter of having to push back a little bit and and kind of you know, it's not, and it's not just women. I mean, like the gay scene suffered, the 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 whole black community suffered. I mean, it just became this kind of white boy thing. And it yeah. why yeah why yeah. I don't know, mm. but it did. But it certainly that certainly wasn't mm. what it was when I got into it. Um, it was super, like everybody inclusive. was on board mm, super mm, inclusive mm, when i got into it and that was mm, part of my love for it what drew me to it was how inclusive it was so um mm, yeah so i i'm i'm really hopeful that we bring it back to that so mm, i think i think um what came to mind when you're just mentioning that is it's like yeah because it was in that early days, it was early and it was um, new and inclusive and a reflection of um, because that's w- why it was wh- why it was born in the first place was because it was a celebration of of all those communities and people coming together. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms, of my theory is is that um, you know because of the music business model and the sort of um, people at the helm and the people who had sort of, you know, um, more wealth opportunities, I guess, and it kind the of like empowerment. evolved. Yeah, the empowerment. To, yeah, the empowerment. Yeah, yeah. To bring people to, to the up, next level. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. right. And, and, um, and, and so we've got this, we had this sort of period that was for a long time where it was sort of white and patriarchal kind of things, I guess. Mm-hmm. And then now it's, it, it's unraveling, it's, it's, it's dismantling and it's like yeah. a sign of the times, you know. Um, what, you know, and, and not to say that we're in the clear, but there's definitely, and there's still inequalities that need to be worked on. And I think, um, I think that's, that's, that's the, the, the era we're going through now is that. Um, well, I worry and, about uh, the clear, as you say, being in the clear, because we thought we were in the clear in the 90s, the early 90s. We thought, you know, yeah. we were having a love revolution. We thought it was the 60s all over again. We thought, you know, peace, love, mm, mm. every the world was a beautiful place and we were all coming together and and we were the proof that that you that, you know, there was one world, one love. Right. And and that got squashed so fast. and. 
So the thing that I see is that as we are all working so hard to bring back equality and diversity and all the things that go with that inclusivity, that we don't lose sight of that, that we don't get comfortable, that we don't think, oh, now we're in the clear. Because if you look at time, when I look back at certain times in my life, I'm like, yeah, I thought it was better then. And it was. And I'm looking at like videotapes and, and like old TV shows. And I'm like, it was better then than it is now. And why are we having all this, this um, friction over these things that I'm sure mm. there was a time in my life that it wasn't as, as much like oppression going on. And mm. um, I think we got comfortable. I think we've, we've forgot to keep pushing, you know, and I think you can't get comfortable is, is the key. You have to always know that, there's there's something always going to be there underlying and you you have to you have to stay you know true to the the feeling and the just the kind of understanding that it's it's not a given you know yeah yeah well um i think uh i think that this is even it, it, it means a lot like you um it's 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 not just like you know you're paving the paving away and and demonstrating something here for for a lot of women you know in this in this scenario here like i think and i don't and and like you said too i don't think it was like intentional or anything from these guys it was just like the status quo you know yeah. of of the the things that they had to kind of um you don't even think about it unless it's presented like, oh yeah, shit, you know, like we should right. do something about this, and yeah, and, then, like- and that's what's, <laughs> mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, um, why don't you tell the the, the listeners um, and the viewers of of the, the new single and where they and, and you know tell us a bit about that. Where is where is it? Oh, the new single. I'm I'm just I'm it's. First of all, I'm just so thrilled to have it out on large. I think they've that Jeff Craven yes. is just an amazing person to be working with and he really gets it and he, you know, it was his choice to do the Mo Cream remix and Mo Cream totally brought it. I love that remix so much. Um and so but the song, the track itself started it was one of those evolutionary tracks <laughs> that started with an idea that then we waited six months and then something else happened and then something else happened but it was basically me and nick um who i've known for years and years through Sam, uh working well, actually we were um governors together in the recording academy for the san francisco chapter way back um and then we became trustees together at national at the national level and that's and so that's when we started talking about doing this track together. It's like, oh, we have to do a track. And I was telling him what I was doing. And I was like, I really want to do this down tempo disco thing. And oh, that sounds cool. And and he had already played on some stuff with my band and um just loved his playing. And I thought, so I I pitched him the idea and I said, I'm gonna send you this stuff. And so I pitch him the idea and I send him over the track, and then he goes back in and he, you know, gives me what I want plus a little bit more, sends it back to me and and then we kind of, I fluffed it up from there and we both went, yeah, that sounds pretty good. It needs a guitar. Yeah, it needs a guitar. We need, it needs a good rhythm guitar. Well, at the time, Nal Rogers was on the board with us <laughs> and we were like, <laughs> we, we need to just ask Niall if he'll do it. I mean, what's he going to say? No. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> you, know, you, you start at the top. I always believe you start at the top. So, I mean... <laughs> So we emailed Niall and didn't get a response. Surprise. <laughs> he was kind of busy. I think he was on tour with Cher at the time or something. But um, so, so we, but we still knew we were like, oh my God, we, we need this guitar. And, you know, and I, my husband plays guitar, but he doesn't play guitar like that. But that's why we ended up with two guitars on it because he played these really beautiful kind of West Montgomery style jazz little licks. And I was like, oh, let's use those. Those are cool. But I still need the rhythm guitar, right? So I I tried everything. I I I mean, I tried to find the right guitar player. I tried to 
I, I got Native Instruments funk guitar. It sounded horrible. I couldn't make it sound good. I, I just, I just tried everything, and I, we just, so it just sat there for a long time, and then I, I kept thinking, oh, if only I knew where Dave Scholl was, because he would play the guitar perfectly. So Dave Scholl's this guy that I used to have back in San Francisco come and play on my tracks here and there. And the guy can play anything. I would just be like, can you play this? And he'd be like, like this. And I was like, perfect. <laughs> so um, I reconnected with him through Facebook. And I said, oh, my God, Dave, you do not know many, how many times I've said, if only I had Dave Scholl. What are you doing? Can you play guitar on this track for me? And he's like, oh, yeah, I can do that. So literally, like, he, I message him on Facebook. He calls me up. We talk. He goes, send me the stuff. I, I think in 20 minutes, I had the parts back. I mean, <laughs> I mean I'm, still, I'm still chopping him up and doing the things that I do, you know, to make him be in the place. But I mean, he's, he's just so good. He gives me all the parts I need. Like he just gives me everything I need. And I've just gone, bum, 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 bum. And I just stuck it all in. And, and I was like, and I sent it off to Nick and I didn't even tell Nick that I'd gotten in touch with Dave and I sent it off and I said, I think it's done now. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, that's, that's all it needed was that little, mwah, little bit of Dave. So. <laughs> oh, it's a great tune. Uh, I loved it. I, um, and I, I'm looking forward to playing it on my radio show. So. Yay. Uh, <laughs> well, Tyler, it was so, it's such a delight to chat with you and get to, to meet you and, um, and, and learn a bit more about you. Yeah. Um, I, I know I wish you all the best with this new, new, um, I wouldn't say it's a new chapter. It's just like, it's a, um, it's a, it's well, a, well, it is kind of, it's just kind it's of, new, yeah, it is. It's but, a you new know, version like, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's super inspiring too. I, I, I love, I love your story and, and I'm glad that, you know, I think, um, I hope uh, we, we, this, on a no doubt it will inspire others, um, uh, yeah, it was just a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you so great, much. Great, great. Thanks so much for having me. Really enjoyed it. All right. Take care.